Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cozy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside, you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they-them pronouns, and I am a morally grey godling. I'm Soren, I use he-him pronouns, and I'm a crossroad town that specialises in brass bells. And I'm India, and I use she-her pronouns, and I'm the bread that Elagas bakes when he is stressed. Soren and I have been friends for over a decade, and the two of us are always swapping books. Each fortnight, the two of us, sometimes with help from a friend, take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. This month is Disability Pride Month. So today, let's get to talking about... God Killer by Hannah Kainer. Today we are here with India. Hello! <laughs> who I have known for... We've known each other less than a year. This is insane. Um, well, I think but... we've known each other less than six months, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maths. Oh no. I'm counting on my fingers. <laughs> oh, somewhere between eight to nine months. Well, hey. Oh my God. Well, it's the best eight to nine months of my life, I will say. <laughs> so, me and India have worked together for about eight months now. <laughs> and you both have read God Killer. So... Yes. Yes. Tell me about how you found out about it. I heard about it through work. Those of you who don't know, I'm a bookseller. They were sending out proofs for the book in preparation for its release. And I've never sent an email so fast in my entire life being like, I would really, really, really love (laughs) if I could possibly read this book. And everybody around me was getting the proofs and reading them and loving them. And all I could see was positive reviews. And I was like, I think I've missed the window. I don't think I'm going to get it. And then I think the book had just come out, like literally just come out. I'd seen all the beautiful sprayed edges and all of that kind of stuff. And then I got a parcel and it was a proof copy. And I was like, this is the best day of my life. Yes. (laughs) I also got a proof. I was just scrolling through Net Galley and I was like, wow, this is a cool cover. I have no idea what this is about, but I'll just hit request. I think this was in the early days of me having Net Galley. So I was just sort of (laughs) quite cavalier with just hitting request thinking, oh, they won't say yes Mm -hmm. to everything. And then (laughs) getting way too many approval. And you're looking at your percentage and you're like, wow, I can't do this. (laughs) It's looking rough right now. (laughs) But God Killer was one of the first ones. I'm very, very happy that I did request it. I remember you messaging me and being like, okay, there's this new book coming out. Don't read it. We're going to do it with the blood. I was pretty sure even like a couple of chapters in, I was like, I feel like we want to do this one on the show. Then Paul Morgan kept being like, everyone's reading it and telling me it's good. And I was like, just wait. Yeah, I read the first couple of chapters and I was like, Morgan's going to love this. And I was shocked that Morgan, you hadn't read it yet. I was like, what's taking you so long to read it? And yeah, here we are. It's all for the bit. It's <laughs> And what is God Killer about? Sorry, and you go. Me? Okay. God Killer is a high fantasy novel about a God Killer who is sort of the equivalent of a monster hunter, except rather than slaying traditional monsters such as werewolves or vampires or something, she slays gods, as this is a setting where gods have been outlawed and often require sacrifices or violence to gain power. She accidentally acquires a child, as you sometimes do, who needs help separating herself from a god who she is bound to, and she ends up visiting the city that used to house all of the gods, along with an ex-knight who was involved in the war that brought down the gods in the first place. Ex-knight turned baker. Ex-knight turned baker, that's important. The baker knight. And also, you make, you make it sound so ominous. She acquired a child. The child <laughs> literally would not let this woman leave. That's true. The child acquired her. <laughs> <laughs> we love a found family trope. Yes, we do. Oh my God. Okay, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Sorry. Let's listen. To the blind. I've heard a lot about God Killer, um, but I'm not sure how much of it is still in my brain. So I'll try to remember everything. Basically, I know that it's about a character whose job is to hunt down and kill gods. I know that there's really good disability representation. I know there are lesbians. I know that it has accidental baby acquisition. Um, Basically, kind of like The Witcher. I think that's actually everything I know. Um, The cover is very vibey. There's a stag on the front, so maybe one of the gods is a stag. Um, I know that the rabbit with wings on the back cover is a character who's quite important because Soren said he really loved that character. So I'm excited to see what the rabbit with wings is doing. Um, I have the Waterstones exclusive edition of the book, so it's got the really pretty end papers and the uh, sprayed edges. So I know that we've got high fantasy, uh, very vibey world building. Um, and honestly, this is just an absolutely gorgeous book. But that... I think is everything. 
Um, and I can't wait to read. Slay. Love it. I knew a pretty good amount, but also not any of the scale. I knew that there's a lot of disability rap in this. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect like every single character to be disabled in like realistic different flavors yes. because it's a post-war society. So it makes sense for everybody to be mm -hmm. some sort of disabled. That was fun. Very refreshing. Didn't know there were bisexuals. I was very excited when they were bisexuals because originally I was like, okay, lesbians. And then Elo or Elo and Kizan started making eyes at each other. And I was like, hang on. <laughs> oh my God. Exactly. I, especially after the first couple of chapters, was just like, we love a lesbian. And I didn't personally see the relationship form as early as I think some people who read it did. So let me tell you, when the romance, when it starts sparking for a split second, I was like, but she only likes women. <laughs> like, Did you forget bisexual people existed, babe? What are you doing? <laughs> and also, they took enemies to lovers to the point where I only thought they were enemies. I did not think we were going to get any romance. I literally was thinking, hello, babe, this woman is literally only for the women. So, like, leave her alone. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, she's not. Do what you got to do, girl. I respect it. And also, I love Elo, so very much respect it. He's an icon. He is. I didn't know about him going in. I didn't know he existed. Neither did I. I was very pleasantly surprised by all the rap, actually, because I had literally no clue going in. And then Kissin's dad... What a prologue. Honestly. Yeah. Oh my God. The stakes were set so high from the very beginning. Morgan and my mutual friend had read like the first chapter in the prologue and all he said is, all you need to know is that the main character's dad's in love with the sea god and then there's a lot of fire. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I read it and I was like, there is a lot of fire. I may have teared up. The prologue literally got me. And then everything like slowed down a bit and I was so scared that something else is going to happen. I'm like on edge the whole time. <laughs> Stressed. She's not afraid to just kill off every single important member in a character's life from the get-go. Mm. So you just know going into it, is anybody really safe? Exactly. When we were introduced to the adventuring party, I was like, you guys have been built specifically to be picked off one by one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More of them survived than I expected, I can't lie. I love the married couple. I was just like, I hope they survive. And they do. And they do. I mean, they're in a pretty like chaotic environment at the end, so they're probably fine. I'm sure they're fine. I'm sure they're fine. Yeah. Yeah. I believe they are. The three old ladies who just want mm. to die together. Oh Stop. my god! And then the one who dies, and it was supposed to be together. I was like, it's not in their plan. I did want to say my biggest takeaway whenever I explain to people about the book is I recently read a bunch of fantasy books that are kind of about five hundred pages. Considering those five hundred pages, I was expecting a lot more to happen in those five hundred pages. But God Killer is, I think, just under three hundred, and there's so much world building, so much setup. I feel like all the characters got like a pretty good amount of page time set up their backstory set up their motivations a bunch of twists and turns and all of this in under 300 pages and i'm looking at everybody else i'm thinking listen god killer packed a punch on every single page and that is my standard for the rest of my reading life yeah, yeah. i think the pacing is really strong it's so concise mm. i was worried going into it that because of how short it was is it going to do as much as it says it's going to do especially the amount of world building i was mm. really shocked that so much was packed in there it didn't feel too overwhelming as well mm -hmm. like you know how usually the first 100 pages of a fantasy novel you have to just be like yeah i don't know what's going on and you pick it up as you go that was less here i was more sort of ingratiated in because it all just made sense and maybe that's because i've read a lot of fantasy now but like it felt chill i think she spent more time setting up the characters rather than doing a big info dump in the first 100 pages i will say that i found the beginnings of the civil war a little bit confusing at the beginning trying to understand how it all started but i felt that the beginning Beginning, like you said, did not feel like wading through pages and pages of magic system establishment. I think it is that tying it into character arcs, like that conversation that Kissen has where she's explaining her encounter with the love goddess. It actually tells you quite a lot about how gods work and how curses work, but it's also telling you about Kissen. Yeah, that pivotal moment where Aaron properly becomes king mm. and all of that. You find out really late into the book exactly what happened that led to those moments and like led to his decision to like ban all the gods. You hear about it, but you don't get like the full picture and the full story until the last couple of chapters. It didn't feel like I was putting loads of puzzle pieces together and getting confused, but it did feel like a slow jigsaw puzzle forming, but not in a way where it was frustrating to wait. I guess because the page number was so short. It did take me quite a long time to read, I can't lie, considering it's only 290 pages. It took me like a week and a half, which maybe doesn't sound like a long time, but we all know me. It took me like months to read this the first time, so I, I don't know what was going on there. It took me three days. <laughs> yeah. 
It took me like three days to reread it. I'm going to blame my dissertation. Mm. As we record, it's due in less than three weeks and it still haven't properly started writing it yet. But I felt like although the law and the world building and all that were really well spruced in, the actual writing was just slightly too chewy for me mm. not chewy in the sense of like purple prize or anything like but chewy in the fact of like it needed streamlining a bit more it was just the sort of thing where i'm like this is a debut and it needed like one more round of editing like just one some things didn't need to be that concise they could have been allowed to breathe a bit more but also dissertation brain so we'll blame that <laughs> i kind of liked how to the point quite a lot of it was i read a lot of brandon sanderson and there is no purple prose with that man. It is very much just to the point. I do love a good purple prose, but certain times with certain books where they have a little bit more of an elaborate way of writing can get lost on me a little bit. So I kind of felt that it was like a good medium to me. I didn't have many criticisms of the book, to be honest. I just genuinely really enjoyed it. But the one thing I would say is I was genuinely shocked that it was a romance about halfway through. I was not against it being a romance. When it was fully formed, I was super in it. But I think at the beginning, they were very, very heavy on the enemies. And I was like expecting it to be maybe more of a slow burn over the series. So it did come as a surprise to me where they suddenly were romantic because I didn't even view them in a romance sense at all because I didn't personally see in the writing and maybe I just clearly missed something that was blatantly obvious. I didn't see much in the writing until it was then at my front door. I think I caught it more on the reread because I was expecting it. Kissing comes in with Pretty Boy and I was like, okay. I thought that was an insult. (laughs) (laughs) Just like a genuine insult, not like a flirty insult. I've been with the same guy since I was 15, so I haven't needed to utilize any flirting. So clearly it just went over my head. <laughs> I didn't read it as a romance. Yeah. Because they are definitely doing the enemies thing and then mm-hmm. they're doing like the grudging allies thing. And yeah. I feel like in the grudging allies stage, there's always so much sexual tension. Yeah. Yeah. Before there's any romance. So I feel like we're going to get in the later books more actual feelings. And right now it's just yeah. more of a like, we're about to die. We might as well bone kind of vibe. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fair. Whereas I feel like they're actually going to explore the relationship a lot more and actually deal with the trauma of like, hey, you summoned the god that destroyed my entire life. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's unpack that before we go any further with this, maybe. Yeah. Before we adopt our co daughter together. Let's. <laughs> and do you know what? It was when I was like, oh. They're just like a cute little family now who all slightly don't trust each other or really particularly like each other, but they are also a family. <laughs> That's what sort of to be. There's like a quote near to the end where they're like, are you going to just show Inara what it means or something like that? Like Kissin is like, oh, you're going to demonstrate to Inara that you should just throw your life away for the first person that asks for it. Yes. That was really good. <laughs> Absolutely. It has great parallels to a book we did, I think it'll be a couple months ago now, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. <gasps> Love. It kind of reminds me of them, yeah. Co-parenting and having to be like, okay, we don't like each other, but we are co-parenting this child right now. We need to set a good standard. I really like the way that it took all of them a really long time to trust each other. Even when they get to Blen Radden and they have kind of bonded, they still don't really trust each other and they've all got their guard up. And I think that was done really, really well because I've seen so many stories where they go on their trip and then they fight a couple of people and then they're like, wow, we're all bonded for life now. Realistically, they've all gone through so much and they've all been betrayed one way or another or lost people one way or another. So I thought it was very realistic, even though it came across like they wanted to stay together. They all also didn't trust each other and I liked how complex it was. Mm. It's the fact that they don't trust each other until Skeddy loses control and like mm. pushes everyone too far which is like such a funny thing because I literally went into that confrontation being like oh my god they're never going to trust them again and they came out of the confrontation being like I trust you now because you've shown me all your true colours that was so funny <laughs> like the fact that Kizan's like I'm going to murder you mm. and then he literally mind controls her child and she's like now you're cool now <laughs> but it made sense everyone sort of like came to a new understanding moved forward with that understanding very good communication though Skeddy on the other hand i know sorry that you liked him i no i I liked him as a character okay okay that little creature irritated me so much love him but my goodness he's making all the bad decisions for the group (laughs) he's just a child he's just driven by his id and if you were traveling with someone who exists to kill your kind that's quite stressful i'm expecting him to be peaceful about it i'm like come on i did like how his view of Kissin shifted after he spies on Ello. He doesn't want to imagine a world without Kissin there to protect him and Inara. Mm, yeah, she's your mum too. I did want to say, and I want this to be explored in the next couple of books, mm. Aaron and Elagast 
were in love with each other. Let's talk about this right now. Oh yeah. I think this was another reason why I was just not viewing Kissin and Elagast together. I was like, Elagast and Aaron are in love and he's doing this big thing. And then when he comes back, they're gonna remember how much they loved each other and they're gonna get together. And then he starts flirting with Kissin and I'm like, your husband's back home. <laughs> and then his husband, his husband was not a nice guy. It was so amazing rereading that scene and Aaron's there like, oh, don't look, I don't want to show you. And it's like, you liar, you bastard. It's so soft. Yeah. He escapes from the palace and he shows up and he bakes bread with Elo. But looking back at it, it's like, what do you mean the king of the whole realm travelled the whole day and no one noticed he was gone? Mm. That's so sus. But also, if a man rode a whole day to bake bread with me, I probably would also go and sell my soul and my heart to the next fire god. That's fair. I'm like, what do you mean you're baking bread with me? But that was not platonic. I don't care what people say. There was nothing platonic about their relationship. And I know that when like he's like gonna go and give his heart to this bloody god, Kissen says, were you in love with him? Did you sleep together? Like, what is this? And obviously it was like, he died for me. But I'm like, there's more to it. You're also in love with him. It's giving big Melon and Arthur vibes. Stop right now. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but also, Aaron, do <laughs> do we think the gods are skewing with his mind? Or this was just always his ultimate goal once he realised he was in power? I feel like it's a bit of absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think they were messing with him a little bit on top of it, though, because there was a moment where Elo says something about him apparently not processing what's going on mm. towards the end. But I also think that Aaron had it in him, because I feel like when he's lying at the beginning, I feel like that's all him. And this is what I'm saying. He knew that Elagas was in love with him. I thought it was going to be an unrequited thing. Mm hmm Maybe other girls is just in denial. <laughs> oh, it's just tough. But also so emotional and very entertaining to read when it happened. I was shocked. I did the classic, like, close the book and I was like, what? <laughs> After that prologue, I was like, we are seeing Seth again. This is a Chekhov's god, as they say. <laughs> And then when she came out of the shrine, I was like, there she is. Shocker to no one. She's just a girl boss, you know? Can't stop a woman doing her job. Yeah. Unless you're the sea. Unless you're the sea. Arn was absolutely such a girl boss of a god. Mm, I loved her. I was obsessed with her. Who I want to be in life. Just a woman chilling, asking for things in exchange for goss. <laughs> Side note, but the way that she's described as being extremely beautiful and also extremely full-figured. Mm. Also, when Kissin's talking about the love goddess, she says that people would go to the love goddess aiming for that, and then people fasting for the love god and that being framed as a terrible thing. I really liked that. Yes. This is the fantasy world, the beauty standards are going to be like that, logically. What I think is also so great about this book in general is the representation is just so good. The amount of disabled people in this Kissen's first chapter as she's walking up to fight that god and she's talking about her prosthesis and how she uses her disability to aid her in the fight. So good. And then when you meet her friends growing up, the sign language, the way that it's just utilized so beautifully and with such ease as well. And that's the thing that stood out for me. And I was like, why am I not doing this more? The author is a consultant for digital healthcare tools and services for the public sector. Oh, no way. Yeah, you can see that she's done so much research. There was so much specific knowledge there. Mm. She put so much care into it. And people having multiple things, like the fact that Kism has a prosthesis, but then she also has a, like facial disfigurement, but then she also sometimes uses a wheelchair, which was really cool to see. Because like I knew she was going to use a prosthesis. And then she also used a wheelchair. And I was like, oh my God. What was done really well as well was the flashbacks that Elo had. Mm. She was covering so much ground in the representation, which I really, really like. So it wasn't just like, oh, this is one way that one person is. Disabilities in general, they affect different people in different ways. And I thought that was displayed very well. If I have one gripe with the whole disability representation, it's the fact that the sign language seems to be this ubiquitous thing across the entire world. Mm. And Inara's talking yeah. about it being like, sometimes pirates use it. And then she is speaking the exact same dialect, apparently, that Kissin uses with Teller, but... It is really, really fantastic. She never forgets about it, which is really nice. Like, if there's extreme heat or extreme cold, Kissin's leg is being affected. The moment when Ello's kneading the bread and he gets the chronic pain in his fingers mm. and he starts shaking and it seizes his joints, I was like, oh my god, Bessie, I've been there so many times. I can't really think of any character who just has chronic pain without a specific source. Mm. I have this chronic pain because I have problems with my leg or something. Whereas like this was just, I have chronic pain because I have chronic pain. That's really not represented as much as it should be. Oh, mm. it was so nice to see. I mean, I'm so sorry for you, Ello, but <laughs> I feel that mood. <laughs>
Also, mm. Ella has chronic pain, and then Aaron shows up and is like, I'm in so much pain. You. <laughs> Reading that scene again, I feel like he was deliberately exploiting that. Aaron is a menace. But then I also wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that actually they were causing Aaron pain to make it like more realistic and also to punish him, because it feels like they control everything about him. I just want to believe this man's a... <laughs> I think he's at least a little on it because he is basically making himself a god. Oh, no, definitely. He's naming rivers after himself and there are songs and he has middle child syndrome. That's where it's coming <laughs> from. He's like, my mom didn't love me as much my- as my sibling. It's in the text. It's right there. It's right there. I um did want to go back though to, there are two favourite tropes of mine. One, I love a ex night ex soldier who has to do one last trip so i think that's why i loved ella as much as i did and then i also love i never want to have kids oh here's a child that needs my love support and help you are now mine kissen and anara have my whole entire hearts also because there's a lot in media of the dad figure and the daughter figure yeah. it was so great to have a mum figure and a daughter figure definitely kissen I love her so much. She's just grumpy and she just needs a little bit of light in her life. And Inara needs somebody to make her worse. And (laughs) that's what she gets. (laughs) I'm ready for Inara's revenge era. Her reputation era, if you will. Oh my God, yeah. Elagast is there to do the, I'm going to do what's right. Like, that's him. That's him, okay? Inara is like, I'm going to burn the entire country down to get revenge. And Kissin will be there. And that's why they are the perfect duo. Because I love feminine rage. Yes. (laughs) Yes. They should go on a rampage together, holding hands. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, wait. Sorry, I just, you know, Kissin's whole like, I don't kill people thing? Yes. Her killing Aaron and being like, you're not a person anymore. Oh! You made yourself into a god. That'd be amazing. The thing that got me with that, it was not even any of that. It wasn't any of Kissin's like, I don't kill people. It was Elagast. Yes, I I do. do. I was like, Yes! He may be a moral high ground most of the time, but he also kills people. I love him. This is why they're the best trio. They cover all the different bases. It's great. Somehow someone's dying. It just depends on which of the three are going to do it. And if you're a god, watch out because Anara can literally stop you doing what you need to do. Okay, I have like an insane theory about Anara, and I don't know if it's insane. Go! Because I didn't get it all on my first read and then I reread this and I was like, no, obviously, right? Because we don't know who her father is. Mm-hmm. Her mother fought Aplan Raiden mm-hmm. and apparently was fighting for the god of safe havens Yusuf who comes up a lot given that he doesn't actually appear or apparently be important like this is her dad she's a demigod right Steph calls her a halfling at the end absolutely because also the thing about her being tied to Skeddy they have that whole thing about like oh a god can like live off another god's power if that god has a shrine Mm -hmm. also Anara wasn't a secret when she was born she went to court and then after the war her mother made her a secret almost as if yeah I didn't pick up on the possible who the parent was. I'm not sure if I'm right about that. That's a bit... But still, that makes loads of sense. I see it. But definitely a demigod. Like, 1,000%. Absolutely. The halfling line for me confirmed it. There's, like, a line where it's, like, you need to go back and speak to your mum and see the way that you were made or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this girl's a demigod. Yeah, Anna keeps implying stuff. And then she says to Kissin, he would feel differently about her if he knew what she was. Yeah. Which is just so good because Kissin kills gods and then her daughter... Is one. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I really, really like how the gods are done in this world. Loads of stories do have like multiple gods, but I just like the fact that you have a broken sandal. There's a god for that, all right? There's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very reminiscent of the Silt Versus podcast. The concept of the Silt Versus is very much there's like just multiple gods, and there's literally a whole company which is like, we're going to make up a new god to advertise to people. Let's make the god of cornflake. You get like advertisements on the radio of like, I'm supporting the god of electricity because I'm a single mother who doesn't have time to do this, this, and this. But with the god of electricity, you can. It just gave that vibe so much. And then it also has the escalation of like, we're banning these gods because like people have started sacrificing people for them. And very good podcast very similar vibes i did have like a rogue prediction that came out so go not was true. i was like scary seth he's got antlers you know who else has antlers the god of war he could be the god of war having lost his memory that is such a good prediction i thought that maybe the god of war was inara's dad which i think kind of doesn't really work because he was working for the other side of the war but he wasn't at the time Oh yeah. Mara's mother was going around being like a fighter a lot of the time. You know, maybe the God of War like respected her a lot. I hope we get some flashbacks on Inara's mum because what a woman. 
I need to know who Skeddy is. Because there's that flashback where he's with the ships, which I assume was that scene where all the ships got drowned and he was there whispering white lies trying to tell people that they'd be okay. But could it be like related to the God of War? Can gods have... What is the genealogy of (laughs) gods? Because it seems like you just manifest from belief, which is... I need a family tree. But also... We know that Inara's mother did some sailing because she talks about sailors. Yes. And we know that somehow Skeddy had to get to where he is now, aka yeah. with Inara. So who do we know who have both been on the sea at some point in the last 20 years? Skeddy and Inara's mother. This is my hot take. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I think they know each other. I don't think this was ever a secret. I don't think they would have been able to keep it a secret from Inara's mother. One thing that confused me a little bit, how does Inara's powers work i think because will is like part of emotions because like emotions fuel will i think it's sort of all clubbed under one umbrella of like it's all about like the vibes you're putting out into the world and then she's just like nope she's the god of free will (laughs) or their lack of if you're getting in her way (laughs) (laughs) oh my god i mean possibly i mean that actually makes quite a lot of sense I did love the emotion colours. I knew you would like that going in, Morgan. As an OG, the Bright Sessions fan, I have been here. I've written so much nonsense about Caleb from the Bright Sessions and how his powers work. Because that's not how it works in the actual show. It's just like, we're going to metaphorically talk about colours. And I'm like, no, he sees colours pouring out of people when he feels their emotions. So this was like everything I've ever wanted. It's like, oh my God, the silver of fear, the red of anger and the blue of love. Give it to me. And then being like different different for different people mm. and tied to like certain traumatic memories that was so cool it's like the yellows colors for like love and affection were aaron's colors oh my god i want to see what they are now because mm. i want to see them turn into like the colors that represent like kissin and anara red kissin's hair or something oh my god. yes do we want to talk about our favorite characters i'm gonna have to go elegast as much as i love a good woman who doesn't take I do love how kind Elagast is and the fact that he knew what he was going to do and he did it out of pure love for his friend, possible ex-lover, and how he's always striving to try and do the right thing. The internal battle he has when he has to do things that go against his like code. And I also, that man, he bakes bread and I love that. So he's my fave. He's yours. Um, I'm going to be really rogue. I love the main trio, obviously, with all my heart. And Skeddy Seth is a problematic fave. And I'm picking an even more problematic fave, and I'm going to say Aaron, just because I loved his page time when I reread, <laughs> because it was so messy. Coming out from behind the shrine, like, hello! Exactly. The absolute panache. And it was also because he's usually the archetype that gets me, in the way that he gets Elo being like, the overlooked son, and he's like actually noble, and he just wants to kill the god of war and free everyone. That's the kind of character, if he was played straight, that I would love. So seeing that character like go through a corruption arc Mm. and become the worst possible version of himself, absolutely immaculate. He's a theatre kid. (laughs) Morgan, who is your fave? Ah, um, <laughs> looking back at it, I think it is Elagast because mm. it itches my soul when you have like a lawful neutral character who's like, this is my set codes of belief. This is what I will do for it. And you're like, okay, isn't it morally great to kill people? And he's like, no, because it's within my moral code. So it's fine. <laughs> um, I said it is fine. So it is. I just love that. And like the fact that he'll go so far and like the fact that he values himself so lowly. And that always gets me every single time. That man was on a path of self-destruction from the beginning. You don't kind of properly realize it until near to the end. And it's kind of heartbreaking when you look back on it. They're all very interesting layered characters. Mm. They're batting a lot against different sides of themselves, which I think is really interesting. But Elagas is my fave. Nothing but respect for my ex knight slash baker. I just love the fact he bakes bread. I'm sorry. I love it so much. I love that he's so invested in bread. <laughs> the fight where he yells out his dumpling advice to Beric because he's like, if I'm going to die, I need to fix this man's dumplings. When he eats them and he's like, this is the worst thing I've ever eaten <laughs> yeah. in my life. And then when Beric sees him again and he's like, you fixed my dumpling. <laughs> When Kizan is like convinced that this is like a cover, yeah. but he's really weirdly invested in this bread. Really like, good at it. <laughs> maybe he is a baker. <laughs> Kizan's like, you can't be a baker and a knight. It is literally impossible. But he's like only 30. That man has gone through so much. Kizan's only 26. Don't even get me started. Inara's 12. But I kind of really want the ending to be that everything works out. And then Kissin, Inara, and, and, and I guess just open her own bakery. 
Oh my God, please. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not going to end like that. Like, it's just obvious. But I'm on my knees begging and pleading that they just open up a bakery at the end of the books. (laughs) It could happen. I'm a big believer in the soft epilogue, so. Mm. Yes. I'm going to keep believing until I'm violently shown otherwise. Do we want to do final thoughts? You're the new reader. You start us off. I really loved it. I loved all the disability exploration, the vibe, the world building, the plot. It all came together. My only thing is I think it needed one more round of editing. It definitely felt like a debut, which is why I'm very excited for the sequel, because I think she will have grown so much as a writer and she won't have to wade through all of the world building to get to the story. So I think this is a 4.5 rounded up to 5. But like, oh my God, I loved it so much. India? I would definitely say I'm also a 4.5 rounded up to a 5 because the sparks between Kissin and Elo came as a little bit of a shock to me at the beginning and I didn't think that it was set up well enough for me personally at the beginning. And I did think there was a little bit confusion with my understanding of the timeline of the war. But those are like teeny, teeny, tiny personal gripes. I loved Kissin and Elagas together, the family vibe. And I really liked the history and the backstory of the world as a whole. Yeah, I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. I'm looking forward to everybody's revenge era in the sequel. I want the entire trilogy now. I think I'm in exactly the same boat. I don't give half stars as a matter of course because I'm afraid of where that would lead. I'll start giving like quarter <laughs> stars. So I'm just going to call it a five because I really enjoyed this. I loved all of the disability rep, the queer rep being so nuanced. I loved the world building, loved the magic system, loved the character development. Very excited to see where this goes. Do we have any recommendations for people that enjoyed God Killer? I would say The Witcher because I think a world full of monsters slash gods and who are looking for that trio and legs and roach are basically the same person as a horse (laughs) also thought based specifically on kissing and inara's relationship the last of us obviously completely different world (laughs) but i think if you liked kissing and inara's relationship and you haven't watched or played the last of us i do think you would enjoy that because it's both two very jaded individuals who find solace in each other. I hope Kissin and Nara's relationship gets explored even more because I really liked it. Surprising no one, my recommendation for this is Grace Link by <laughs> Kristen Cashel. Accidental Child Acquisition, Disability Rep, Feminism, Trauma, same book, different font, I think what Morgan sometimes says. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, different feel, much lower magic. Some actually very interesting themes being explored with the little magic there is in terms of free will and control and power and does absolute power corrupt, absolutely. Oh, and then the other thing that I was going to say, actually, it's also a non-book recommendation, but the second Citadel, which is one of the storylines in the Penumbra mm-hmm. podcast, if you're looking for a disabled knight with a horse as his emotional support slash service animal and cool world building, fun religious system, kid protagonist as of the second season, I believe, I can't remember, but very well written kid protagonist. Oh, and also obviously super queer. Yeah. Sir Caroline Kisson. Yeah. Yeah. My recommendation, I mean, the Silt Verses, absolutely 100%. If you like the whole gods and band religion vibes and rituals, just incredible vibes all around. My second recommendation, I'm going to go Rogue. There's no children in this one. Frontier by Grace Curtis. It's like a sci-fi western. It's about a woman trying to get back to her love interest. The whole book is just her journey. It's really interesting because each chapter she's described as something different. She's never given a name until the very end. Ooh. Mm. Fun world building. And it's not about the angry planet. It's about the long way there. Oh, nice. I get this reference. (laughs) Thank you, India, for being here. You are an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I've literally had the best time of my entire life. If people want to find you, where can they find you? I'm pretty much India Reads A Lot on pretty much every form of social media. I have a blog, which is indiareadsalot.com. I post on TikTok the most because I keep forgetting to post on Instagram. But India's TikToks are really good. So if you're listening to this, you should definitely go watch them. Thank you. I, I do. I do try. We're manifesting that by the time this episode comes out, she'll be doing a series where she reads the Hunger Games. <laughs> I actually know, I bought um, all three Hunger Games books at a charity shop. Whoever donated them, I love you forever. And I think I will. So there you go. If if that exists, go check it out on Instagram. Yeah. I have until whenever this comes out to put that together. So next time, I will be forcing Soren to read Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. Rewired my brain when I read it. I am so excited for Soren to read it. I think he's going to absolutely love it. But I will not say any more because otherwise I will go on about it for hours. So until then, you're always welcome to the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Plain Prod. 
On this episode, you heard India Reads a Lot, Morgan Greensmith, and Soren Briarwood discussing Godkiller by Hannah Kainer. You can find out more about this book at hannahkainer.com, and you can follow Kainer on Twitter at hfkainer. A huge thank you to India for joining us for this episode. You were a killer guest. You can find her at India Reads a Lot on most social media platforms, but mostly on TikTok. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next? Or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com or send us a DM on social media. We'd love to hear from you. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or a review. Or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 17th of July, we'll be discussing Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase.